All right. So uh, thanks everyone for attending uh, the colloquium this week. So I think we're on the, we're on the, the fifth one this semester. And um, today we're really lucky to have uh, Marco Gabardi uh, here from Boston University. Um, and Marco's uh, done a lot of really cool research on uh, tons of stuff, including um, you know, things around the semantics of programming languages, uh, um, even some of the, you know, work in my own area on graded co-effects and things like this. And so uh, I'm really interested in seeing what Marco is working on with relational symbolic execution. So uh, thank you, Marco, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you. So first of all, uh, Arley, thank you very much for uh, organizing this service for the community. I think it's very nice uh, of you guys. And uh, thank you for the invitation. So I hesitated uh, a bit in uh, what to present because uh, I know, uh, of course, uh, that uh, there uh, you guys are strong in uh, semantics of programming languages and uh, uh, grading, but I decided to present something slightly different. Uh, uh, on which uh, I have been working with uh, my former student, Gian Pietro Farina, who now is at uh, Lipier, and uh, Stephen Chong. And uh, this is a topic related to some of my research that touch uh, also outside area like differential privacy. So let me start. So, um, this talk started from a realization that the programming language and the um, foundation of a security community have uh, had, uh, several years ago now that uh, often to reason about uh, security and privacy, it is convenient to do it uh, in a relational way. What uh, we mean by relational way uh, is often convenient to think about uh, uh, two program or uh, in, a, in some specific case, the same program and to reason uh, about the uh, security properties as a uh, um, relation that uh, can be, how relation over input can change when uh, they, uh, the input are processed uh, through the problem. So usually we specify a relational verification in terms of some relation on the input and relation on the output. A classical example is uh, from the 80s is the idea of non-interference. In non-interference, we want to guarantee that confidential information do not flow in what is considered non-confidential. So in general, we, we want to allow flows of information from some uh, public uh, uh, channel, let's say, to some private channel, but we don't want to have uh, the reverse. We don't want the information to flow from private to public. And the non-interference is very uh, nicely captured by a, in a relational way. We can say that the program P is non-interference if uh, when we execute the, two pro uh, the program in uh, uh, on uh, data that are uh, equivalent on the public part, then we get uh, also output uh, that are equivalent on the public part. So if our program uh, for every input, uh, for every pair of input that are equivalent uh, on public uh, data, return something that is uh, equivalent again on public data, then we have uh, non-interference. So there is no flow of information from the private part to the public one. But also another realization that uh, uh, the security and privacy community have had uh, several years ago is that in uh, um, to formulate uh, probabilistic, uh, to formulate notion of security and privacy, it is often convenient to use a probabilistic notion. And so we can uh, try to merge these two ideas and uh, people have done this uh, several times. For instance, we could define a notion of uh, probabilistic non-interference, which is defined very much like uh, we did before, except that now the program that we are taking is uh, probabilistic. And uh, 
um, what we require is that the distribution that we have now in output are equivalent on public data for a specific uh, notion of equivalent. Now, these, uh, um, these allow us again to reason relationally about uh, um, non-interference and about security properties. And uh, what uh, this uh, in general mean is that uh, we can uh, look at a specific uh, situation where we have an equivalence on uh, distribution when we look at, uh, uh, at uh, public data that are equivalent. So often is considered an equivalence uh, relation. But in general, we when we look at other uh, security and privacy notion, we may want to generalize this. In particular, a property that yeah, will Marco? be, yes. Yeah, there was one question um, on the chat. Uh, they're asking, what's a probabilistic program? Yes, okay. So this is a left uh, quite uh, general uh, intentionally. We, you can think about uh, any program that uses some uh, source of randomness, uh, like uh, uh, random sampling from uh, uh, zero one or random sampling from the uniform distribution in the interval zero one. So I'm not taking a specific uh, language at this point. I'm just talking in general about program that uses some randomness and that uh, produce uh, some uh, where we can uh, see the output uh, not as a single uh, uh, output, but more as a distribution over output. And one notion that I will use uh, quite a lot in my talk is the notion of uh, differential privacy which uh, is a, you can think about it as a kind of generalization of non-interference, but uh, also as a kind of adaptation. So the relation we are interested in the input is that uh, we take two data that differ for one individual data. So you can think about the input as a kind of databases and they differ for uh, the data of a single uh, individual. And then the relation we are interested in output is not that the two distribution are equivalent, but they are approximately equivalent for some notion of approximation that we will look a bit more later, but which in general depend on some parameter, let's say epsilon. So relational reasoning is something that the community have uh, studied a lot. Uh, there is a uh, vast literature on method uh, that first uh, try to reduce uh, relational reasoning to standard unary reasoning. There are techniques uh, that uh, try to say that I can take uh, the relational approach I just presented and consider them uh, as uh, just uh, one program by doing some form of composition. Uh, these various form of composition can be different as some has proposed a notion of product program. But also when we reason, for instance, in semantics about logical relation and parametricity, often we are doing a, a similar uh, uh, reduction in the sense that we are taking a, a relation in the model, but we are taking a single program. More in general, the literature has also focused on method where we can really reason relationally. There are various forms of relational program logic. I think the first one was introduced by Nick Benton. Uh, relational or logic was introduced by Nick Benton in the 90s. And uh, after that, there has been a lot of work in this direction and also a lot of version of a relational type system. So you, there is a bit uh, the technique you want uh, that you can use for uh, relational reasoning. A last form that I want to mention that will also be the focus of my talk is a relational form of symbolic execution. This is something that has appeared a bit more recently, but I think uh, is an interesting approach. And this is why I will uh, focus on it. So why symbolic execution? Originally, 
So most of my work is on uh, uh, program semantics or a type system or a program logic. So why do I want now to look into symbolic execution? Actually, it turned out that symbolic execution is where I started from because uh, when I was an undergrad, I did my senior project. Uh, uh, for my senior project, I implemented the symbolic execution engine for Java. And so it's a bit of uh, going back. But I think uh, one uh, reason why symbolic execution is nice is that it's a very simple idea. It's the idea of uh, taking a program, executing it on uh, variables, uh, symbolic inputs, and then collecting path condition and uh, try to study the reachable states. What I think is uh, nice besides that is that uh, it supports both verification and search for violation, finding counterexample. And this is something that some of the other techniques I mentioned before do not support. And uh, also it can be easily integrated with uh, additional con constraint solving. So actually, uh, I think uh, symbolic execution was uh, one of uh, the first place where uh, constant solving was used uh, heavily. So let me try to go a bit more, give a bit more details. So what uh, is a symbolic execution if people haven't seen it before? We can think uh, that mainly we start, uh, uh, we can think about this as a kind of operational semantics where we execute our program. Uh, again, I, I'm trying to keep the word program quite uh, generic here on uh, some uh, abstract memory where uh, by abstract, I mean, is a symbolic memory where we don't have concrete values, but uh, we have uh, just uh, symbolic values, variables. And then we execute it. And since we are executing on variable, we need to uh, use uh, a semantics that um, can have some non-determinism and uh, collect uh, all the possible state that we can reach. And in doing this, uh, we characterize a state by a memory that we can reach, but also by some path condition that tell us how we get to that memory. So you can think about when you have an if then else, you can uh, take the condition true and the condition false and uh, keep running and execute uh, your program. Now, what I think is nice is that we can reach uh, this idea uh, so to, to see if a state is feasible, then we can use the path condition to see if they are uh, uh, consistent or if they are inconsistent. And what I think is nice with this approach is that we can integrate even more constraint than uh, in uh, the basic definition. So we can uh, use uh, arbitrary constraint and design well our symbolic execution to reason um, relationally as uh, I want to do. So in particular, we can uh, record in uh, this uh, constraint uh, some assumption, some uh, relational uh, property, for example, but we can also record out the memory change and the path condition so that we have a well-designed tool to study the behavior of our programs. I said that um, we can do verification and uh, we can also search for uh, counterexample. And uh, the reason for this is that it's easy to define two approaches that I show here. We could define a verification triple, I use blue here, which is uh, a kind of uh, or triple by just looking at all the possible execution. And then we check that the constraint that we collect satisfy the post conditions. If we start from the precondition P, then we execute our program uh, symbolically and we check that the constraint then imply the post condition. Here one has to be a little careful in the sense that has to design uh, the, the symbolic execution in, in a way that uh, the validity or invalidity of P is preserved so that this implication does what we want. In particular, if P is uh, uh, false, we want to be able uh, uh, to derive uh, everything like uh, we can do in uh, our logic, for example. But we can also define with the same tool a refutation uh, triple. So we can think uh, about this as uh, 
uh, witnessing a, a counterexample. And this is something that instead we cannot easily do usually with other tools because of the soundness of these tools. So for instance, in program logic, it's not easy to reason about this. There are some attempts that uh, people uh, are coming up with. There is uh, a theory that has been the, uh, is being developed, but uh, if you take, uh, or logic is not a reason, it's not designed to reason about this. And uh, how we can uh, do refutation, we can again start our symbolic execution in the same way and collect all the, our constraint. And then we need to find the witness of the unsatisfiability of the post condition. So we need uh, to be able to satisfy the constraint, but not the post condition. So that these uh, give us a failure of our uh, implication. Now, when somebody uh, talk about counterexample, also come to mind testing, but it's worth to keep in mind that the testing and symbolic execution are two different principles. In symbolic execution, we are really uh, analyzing our program by executing it uh, on uh, symbolic values. While on testing, we work uh, on concrete values. Of course, uh, we can uh, uh, create several combination and one combination that is uh, that has proved to be very successful is concolic testing which is a concrete symbolic testing which combine the two but is uh, useful to keep in mind that they are different so mainly to sum up in this uh, first part of the uh, talk, what I really uh, am interested in here is in a tool that allows me to uh, verify and uh, also finding violation for a relational property in the same tool. And this is why I think a symbolic execution is a good approach. Now, how do we extend the symbolic execution? In our work, uh, we extend it along three lines. So first, uh, we we extend it in a relational way so that we can uh, use a relational assumption to reduce the search space uh, that we have for uh, counterexample or for proving uh, uh, validity. We also we will uh, use a symbolic management of probabilities. So you can think about our semantic as a kind of a distribution transformer semantics. We don't do concrete sampling. Yeah, when you think about uh, probabilistic program, uh, probably you think more about the sampling based uh, semantics where you sample a value and you continue with this value. We use instead the symbolic management of probabilities. And then we combine the constraint solving that we have in this framework with uh, some ideas that come from uh, reasoning uh, relationally about uh, uh, probability distribution. In particular, we use the idea of coupling that has been uh, used before uh, extensively. I will not present uh, concretely our language, but uh, mainly the way to think about our language is a four language. You can take a four toy language where you have assignment, if then else, four loops, and uh, concatenate, and uh, sorry, uh, composition. And then uh, what we add are symbolic variable, arrays, probabilities, and then this uh, construct here that you see here, which remind you probably of a pair, and uh, is intentional, is uh, the idea that uh, this is what we use uh, to uh, consider two programs. So we will fill uh, this all with two different programs, and then uh, we will uh, be able to run uh, our program in a relational way. So what uh, does our symbolic execution look like? We can think about it, as I said before, as a kind of operational semantics. And the way we design it is that uh, is a, a six place. Uh, so a configuration is a six place relation where we have uh, 
two symbolic memories that we can use to reason about uh, executing uh, the first program and executing the second program. A program C, but remember that this program C can contain the pair that I just showed you before, which is not exactly a pair, but is more like uh, I execute these two program somehow in parallel, but we are not interested in uh, whether it's in parallel or in sequence. It's just that they will be executed. And then we have uh, some probabilistic constraint to reason about uh, uh, probabilities. As I said, we treat them in a symbolic way. And then we have a symbolic constraint as a standard in symbolic execution. Let me give you two rules uh, that uh, hopefully will give you a feeling uh, of how this works without going too much into the de details. So here is a classic uh, rule for uh, if then else. So you see here the name. This is the R if conk conk true false rule. Now this uh, long name as a meaning is not just that is there first name we decided. So this is a relational if a rule with, where it happened that the two values that, the, uh, that our expression, the test of the if uh, converge to, which are represented by this projection in the first memory and projection in the second memory of the value a, B that we obtain here. And, uh, concrete, so both of them are concrete. So you can think of them, for instance, as uh, uh, integers. And also that uh, one make uh, the test of the if, uh, which uh, we, is a test for zero, true, and the other false. So in particular, what we are saying is that we are executing this if, and we know that we will uh, the test will give us two different values that uh, require us to explore the two different branches of the if, C1 and C2. And so in particular, what this uh, whole configuration we are reduced to is to this pair construction where we mainly execute both C1 in the first memory and C2 in the second memory. And we update everything else. Let me give uh, another example where we use uh, more the symbolic and the probabilistic part. So is, this is again a if then else rule. I have to say that the previous one actually doesn't use a symbolic, uh, is not a symbolic uh, rule. We don't have symbolic constraints. So this is just a five place relation. In this one, instead, we use also symbolic, uh, you see this S here. Now, what this rule is, is again an if rule, but where the first uh, evaluation now is probabilistic, and the second one instead is symbolic. What it, this means is mainly that uh, the two value that we obtain by our test, one represent a probabilistic condition that we had before, and we see we denote this uh, by the fact that this is an expression over probabilistic uh, expression. And uh, instead the second, in the second, run of the program, we are instead looking at a symbolic value. And so what we do is we need to update both the, the first memory probabilistic constraint by adding a constraint on them, and by updating the symbolic constraint by adding another constraint on them. Now the two constraints are one greater than zero and the other less than zero because uh, this is the true false uh, rule. Okay, so this was just to give you a flavor of how our system work. This is a good moment maybe to take a, a little break and take some question if there is any on uh, what a symbolic, uh, ex relational symbolic execution mean. And then uh, what I will do after is uh, we'll uh, go a bit more into the properties and application and uh, then we'll conclude.
But if there is any um, question, I'm happy to take I, I have a question. Yeah. So um, I was wondering whether you have ever considered um, runs or symbolic executions of the system where you don't quite know what the input itself will be, but you know that, for example, for, I don't know, 15% of, of the situations, it, was, it will be this one or, or in this um, given, uh, uh, you know, domain. And then for another 25%, for example, it will be, let's say, between 10 and 5, and then 15% between that and that, and you know, you have a distribution. So you, you let's say that you, you have a uh, CDF yeah. of the input. So very good question. So uh, we start without a distribution in input, but what uh, you are saying is mainly what is uh, collected in this uh, constraint. So. I will show later also a rule for sampling, but mainly in this constraint we have here, you can think about these as a probabilistic variables. And so what, you are, what this constraint is saying is that this variable is greater than zero, but these represent a probability distribution. So we are conditioning the probability distribution to be uh, greater than zero in this path. So mainly suppose that this is a, a Gaussian distribution, we are saying with 50% probability, we take this path. Because, uh, sorry, a Gaussian center in zero. Uh, suppose that this is a Gaussian center in zero, then uh, uh -huh. with 50% probability, we will take this path. Right. So, so the Probability information is stored here. Okay, probably you're not showing all of all of the details of how you store that, but uh, I, I take it that you do that there. Yeah, so this is, you are right. So mainly, I will show you later another rule, but I can anticipate here, where here you store also the distribution uh, the variable would come from. So the fact that this is a Gaussian would be stored, for example, in a P1 prime. And so these represent okay, mainly distribution. Right. Okay. Um, I have one more question, but maybe that I should ask later. Okay, sounds good. All right. So what are the properties that we have of this uh, framework? So first of all, we can prove that mainly every uh, trace, every trace, yes, that um, um, every pair of concrete trace are covered by our probabilistic relational symbolic execution. This is a standard property that you want from symbolic execution because you want to say that uh, every concrete trace, so without any symbolic variable, can be captured by our, um, by our uh, symbolic execution. So it's a kind of a completeness with respect to the concrete semantics. We also have a soundness for verification. So meaning that if we can, uh, we can, uh, prove this judgment following what I introduced a bit before. So this was uh, the one where we check the implication between the final state and the post condition, then this is uh, valid for the concrete semantics. And we have also soundness for refutation, which means that again, if we have something like this, uh, that is uh, valid, then uh, this is valid uh, with respect to the concrete semantics. But I need to be more precise here, because when we move to the probabilistic setting, this refutation triple requires us to check also the probability. What does it mean? The probabilities of set of trades. What does it mean? I say that we have this constraint over probabilities and they contain also expression like this variable is a Gaussian. Now, this constraint need to be solved for uh, uh, making sure that uh, this is a, uh, that we have a good counterexample. Otherwise it could be a false positive. 
Okay, so in uh, the remaining of my time, I would like to go to a concrete uh, re relational verification set in the one of differential privacy to motivate uh, the last ingredient that I want to present that is the idea of uh, probabilistic coupling. I think uh, it's better to first present the application and then uh, look at this concept. So differential privacy is uh, an idea that came up in uh, uh, data analysis and the, in, uh, in particular in, uh, with the goal to have a, a private data analysis. And is uh, actually a nice, uh, very nice uh, definition that you see here. And let me try to walk you through this. So this is a property of a probabilistic query, the, uh, the original paper called them, but uh, we can think about this as a probabilistic program, a program using uh, uh, randomness. And, and uh, remember that we want, actually this uh, will be a relational property. So we are interested in uh, showing that somehow the output of executing this program are close and to say how close we use this privacy parameter epsilon. And we say that this program is uh, epsilon differentially private is uh, if uh, when we take two databases differing in one individual, so in one individual data, we have uh, this uh, property. This property tells us that the two distribution that we get in output are almost the same. So almost the same except uh, for this uh, slack multiplicative slack in, uh, exp in an exponential in epsilon. Now, I think uh, this uh, is a uh, fit nice for us because it allows us to talk about a bit more rich relational property than just the probabilistic non-interference, which require equality. Instead, as an input relation, we, we have that the two data need to differ in one individual. And also we have a richer relation in output because we have a similarity measure between distributions. You can think about the distribution as being close in some form. And also one reason why we like to work on differential privacy is that is quite uh, used in practice. So uh, is uh, becoming more and more popular and so also more important to develop a verification tool. So several companies are uh, actually looking into develop a, a language based tool for uh, help with differential privacy. But let me give you an example of uh, a program that is uh, differentially private. This program that you see here in, uh, in this box is an example. So what does this program do? It takes a database, it takes epsilon, which is our privacy parameter, and return a real number. And what it does is just it count, uh, let's say, how many record I have in D, we store this in S and then we add the Laplace noise. So we, this S plus Laplace, you can think about this as a sampling from the Laplace distribution with this scale, a scale that depends on the value of epsilon and the return this value. Now, if you don't know what the Laplace distribution look like, you have it here on the slide. So, uh, Laplace distribution uh, look like this is a two exponential distribution symmetric uh, uh, along uh, some axis. And what is uh, the reason why this is uh, differentially private, this uh, uh, program is differentially private is uh, somehow actually described by this picture. So you can think about this, the blue curve about running this program on a first database and then changing one element and run it again. And that would be the red curve. And mainly these two distribution for the property of Laplace are epsilon apart for the notion of epsilon weakness. Now, this is not a really um, this is a kind of a very quick crash course on differential privacy is just to give you a flavor of uh, why is a relational uh, 
um, property. Okay, so we reason exactly in this way. We run the program two time and we look at the relation between their output. Now, another important property that uh, uh, I think as a programming language uh, people we can appreciate uh, is that it also has uh, some form of composition differential privacy. In particular, if I take uh, uh, K different uh, program which are all uh, epsilon differentially private then we can think about the overall process as k epsilon differentially private so uh, of course you can take different epsilon and this would still be composition so as an example we could take a program similar to the one before but where uh, so we take again a database our epsilon but now we want to perform three queries the first one count uh, how many A's I have in the database, the second how many B's I have in the database, and the third uh, how many A and B's I have in the database. And to each one of them we add Laplace, but now instead of adding Laplace of uh, one over epsilon, we do one over a third of epsilon because we have three queries so that uh, the overall uh, process is epsilon differentially private. So we use a composition here to show that this is a differentially private and epsilon differentially private in particular. What, uh, um, what I think is nice is that we can decompose this and we can think about this epsilon as a kind of budget that we can use for individual queries. And we want that our overall budget doesn't uh, um, doesn't uh, exceed the, the epsilon that we have, okay? Now, how things can go wrong in differential privacy? So unfortunately, not all the examples are as simple as the one I show you. So here I show you um, several variations of an algorithm that people have used, and uh, I will introduce it also more concretely later in my talk. And um, it turned out, so the, all of these has appeared in some form either in paper or, or lecture note, and it turned out that three of them are differentially private. Two of them, they are, which are the original uh, proposal plus uh, an improvement that this paper was uh, suggesting. And one is a different, I call it a differential privacy-ish in the sense that is a differentially private, but not for uh, the value of epsilon that uh, uh, we want. So for this, um, the reason for this, I think, is that um, uh, getting differential privacy right is uh, hard because it's a complex property. And for this reason, the uh, formal method and programming language community have proposed a lot of uh, different ways to reason about differential privacy. So I'm omitting uh, most of uh, the citation. There is uh, really a lot of work in the area that is uh, now difficult uh, to put uh, all in one slide. I just mentioned uh, uh, some of the work here uh, because uh, they follow a bit the same approach that we are trying to follow, which is the one of combining verification and search for counterexample. One appeared at Leaks uh, last year um, the work by Bart et al, where they give a logic for reasoning about uh, differential privacy, which is uh, uh, can be used to decide both for uh, verification and counterexample. There is uh, another uh, paper at CCS 2020 where they um, suggested a method that is uh, based on uh, also some kind of uh, relational verification. And finally, there is uh, Another work, I think it appeared at Uppsala, if I remember well, 2020, and uh, is uh, uh, based on an approach that is actually quite similar to our, but more based on testing. So in, uh, uh, let me give you now some concrete counterexample of how can uh, things go wrong. So, 
I want to build up to get to the example I mentioned before, but let's start with something simple. So these are the two examples I showed you before, but, so, but slightly modified. So suppose that here, instead of epsilon in the example we had before we had epsilon, somebody write two times epsilon. And here, instead of dividing by three, we divide by two. Now, what turned out is that both these algorithms are not epsilon differentially private. They are still differentially private, but for other values than epsilon. So in particular, this is two times epsilon differentially private, which give less protection because a smaller epsilon and more protection we have. So this will give us less protection than what we expect and this similar. So you see, it's easy to get things wrong if we don't use the right parameter. This is the first step. But then uh, when uh, the algorithm become more complex and this is uh, the algorithm I show you before uh, that people got wrong, uh, the way we can go wrong are multiple. So let me first uh, try to explain you what this algorithm does. Suppose that we have a database, we have a threshold T and we have a list of queries that we want to run on the database. What this algorithm do, uh, what this algorithm does is very simple. It goes through the list of uh, queries. It check if the query in a position I on the database is greater than T, then uh, it uh, return the position I and the stop. So we use this B as a flag to stop the uh, going into this if. Otherwise, uh, just uh, keep going until the end of the uh, list. Okay, so sorry, maybe I explained it uh, badly. So it does, uh, it does go through all the list, but uh, the first time that find uh, a query that is above the threshold, the set the index to this threshold, to this uh, index, and then uh, it doesn't go in the loop in the if anymore and finish when the four is over. Okay, so you have a list of queries. You look at the first one that goes above the threshold. Now, if we want to do this differentially private, we can add some noise again, similar to what we did before, and in particular, we can add the noise to both the threshold and to the queries. The reason why we want to add the noise to the threshold is not that we think about the threshold as something private, only the database we can think as something private, but uh, it's because we can use this in some way. In particular, if we just try to add the Laplace to the query and then do an analysis by composition, mainly we would have uh, the um, that the analysis we get is that this algorithm is uh, the number of queries time epsilon over four plus epsilon over two differentially private. Now, this expression is not really interesting uh, what is uh, precisely, but uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that it depends on the size of the query. So it depends on the size of the list of queries. So on how many queries we have. But in fact, by using this noise on the threshold, we can prove that is epsilon differentially private. So it doesn't depend on the number of queries. And this is a bit uh, magical. I will not give you a proof of this, uh, but is the reason why is an interesting algorithm. And people uh, in the list I showed you before have tried to improve this algorithm. And the idea was, uh, Let's try to improve it by adding less noise. So some algorithm has uh, removed the noise from uh, the query. Some other has removed the noise from the threshold. Some other say that instead of just returning the index, let's return the value that I get. So not only if I'm above the threshold, but also what is the value that I get. Now, each of these modification will break the algorithm and will give a failure of differential privacy. 
So we need to do, be smart and use uh, some tool to reason about this example, and in particular to find the violation or to verify them uh, that are non-trivial. And so going back to my approach here is where the combination of heuristic and uh, this notion of coupling that I will present help us. But let me say first how, sorry, but let me say first how point one and point two can be used. So how we can use a relational uh, symbolic execution and also symbolic management of probabilities to help. Marco, so we can think, yes. So the, if you can go back to the two wrong algorithm you showed us. Yes. So, I'm sorry, maybe you said it, but I missed it. Why were they developed? Like they were trying to reduce the, no the noise or what was the purpose of saying, let's try to tweak the original algorithm? Yeah, so uh, maybe something I didn't, uh, um, I should have said about differential privacy. So there is a, in differential privacy, there is a tension between uh, how useful is your analysis and how much noise you add. So it's easy to make things private by completely um, adding noise, uh, adding a lot. I mean, the most private is you throw away your data and just return a random answer. So in particular, every time you add the noise, you, are you can think that you are changing the utility of your analysis. So in this example, for instance, if you are interested that in just knowing if the query is above the threshold, you will not know it with certitude. It will be only probabilistic depending on how much noise you add. So if you add a lot of noise, maybe it's a query that is very far from the threshold. And so mainly your analysis become less useful. And so this constant tension between uh, utility and privacy bring people to try to tweak as much as possible the algorithm and try to have them uh, as uh, optimal as possible. Okay, thank you. Does it make sense? Yes, yes, completely, thanks. Okay, so how can we use a relational assumption? Uh, relational assumption, I think about them as a way to coordinate the exploration of the different path. Here I designed some uh, uh, tree representing the exploration of the, all the state of a um, program. And when we run two program, we can use a relational assumption to mainly coordinate among the two execution. And this can help us rejoin, uh, reduce the search space. For uh, an example, in general, we are not interested in running those on two arbitrary databases, but only in databases that differ in one element. So this uh, reduces the search space a lot. And for instance, we can reduce it even more because in several algorithms, we want some of the parameter to be like uh, identical between the two run. Maybe only the database is the only thing that we want to change and all the rest is instead equivalent. And so we can use this uh, relational assumption here. The symbolic treatment of probabilities, and this is actually an example of a rule that I mentioned before. Here we are uh, processing a sample from the Laplace distribution. And what we do is we record this in our probabilistic constraint. Now, what this does mainly using probabilities in this way allow us to avoid sampling and collect instead uh, probabilistic constraint that we can try then to solve uh, with some tool. So, and we can do this in several ways. So we record in the probabilistic constraint both the distribution we use, but also path constraint that depend on this distribution. So in the case of this above threshold that I showed you before, we would record the Laplace that we run, but also the condition whether we pass the um, test or not. Finally, the third idea is this idea of uh, probabilistic coupling. Now, if uh, some of you like more uh, category theories and monads, uh, 
Not that I don't like them, I actually like them, but in this talk I try to avoid. But you can think about uh, this approximate probabilistic coupling as a form of uh, relational lifting of the probability monad. So in particular, we are trying to lift a relation from uh, memories to distribution and uh, is a technical tool for doing that. I will actually skip the exact definition because I'm a bit uh, running out of time and these are quite technical, but you can find it uh, in uh, some of uh, our uh, papers. There is uh, actually a lot of uh, literature on that now, not only uh, our paper, I mean, uh, there are several paper on it. Now, um, maybe let me just say one thing. So mainly this uh, coupling uh, is uh, a relation between two distribution and is parameterized by a relation R and by a, a para privacy parameter epsilon that tell mainly the, the two distribution with respect to the R relation epsilon apart. And in particular, when we take the equivalence relation, we can show that uh, if two program, two memories that differ for one individual, and what we get at the end is a equal epsilon coupling, then we can show that uh, these two programs are epsilon differentially private. Okay. Now, let me give you an example. Actually, the only example I will use, which is uh, again about the Laplace distribution. But now I generalize a bit of what I show you before. So I don't add the Laplace distribution to the count like I did before, but I add it to some arbitrary function of the data set. So I take a function f, I apply the function to the data set, and then we add the Laplace distribution. Now, what we can show is that if we look at these two programs, program, we can put them in this relation here that you can, a relation between the output. You can think about Z1 as the output of one and Z2 as the output of the other. And we ask that their output are in this relation. So Z1 plus K is equal to Z2 for some K. So this is the relation we are lifting. And this form in R for this relation, H epsilon coupling, where H is a bound on this formula, which is K plus the result of the function minus on the first data set minus F on the second data set. So let me try to explain what is going on here. Here we are trying to relate the output distribution through this relation, but based also on what we sum to the Laplace distribution, which are these f and f here, and two additional parameter k and h, which mainly play the role of how much far they can, the two output can be, and how much I need to pay, you can think about this as the budget, the privacy budget for having this difference. So in particular, you see that if I set K to zero, I have equality. And so in particular, I have differential privacy as we discussed before about this. Now, what do we use the coupling for? Mainly the main intuition is that we can use this to um, having to talk about the relation between elements in these uh, um, trees that I show here that you can think also as a kind of uh, the execution tree of the program to coordinate the control flow. So we can say, for example, that uh, in the first execution, I will uh, uh, I will be above the threshold in the sixth run. And I want this to happen also in the second run. So I can coordinate this and pay some epsilon to have this. So by using, the, by using this uh, reasoning principle, 
we can uh, then uh, prove uh, something like above threshold or uh, we can try to find contraexample. Now, how can uh, we achieve this uh, through symbolic execution? Mainly we add the, the constraint uh, we saw before to our uh, symbolic execution. And uh, we also use some ghost variable to deal with the privacy budget. Now, this is the nice uh, uh, intuition, but uh, how it look in practice is a bit more complicated. So this is our rule that perform this. You can see this uh, constraint, but as you see, there is a lot of detail that I'm uh, uh, hiding. I know we are running out of time, so let me mention just that we inherit the properties that we had before. And for uh, refutation, since uh, we need to compute the probabilities, we also identify some heuristic that we could use instead of directly compute the probabilities. So this heuristic try to mainly identify ways to find counterexam potential counterexample. They need still to be checked, but they, uh, they can give us some more likely counterexample. And I think this I already said is just another way of writing this. So with this, I think I will conclude. So what I try to give you is the idea of a framework for relational verification and for generating counterexample for relational properties. We saw this uh, specifically in the setting of uh, differential privacy, which I think is a, an important property, but also give us an intu a more concrete intuition of what we can do to do verification and finding counterexample. And uh, what we plan to do, what uh, uh, my goal is for the future is find better way to uh, find a good balance between the complexity of the constraint that we generate uh, and, uh, and uh, how to solve them and also how to generate them. And with this, uh, that's everything I have to say today. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, great. Thanks, Marco. That was really great. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions? I have one. Sure, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, thank you for the talk. I uh, This was completely new to me. I, I had uh, never seen anything like this before and, and it was at a very good level of abstraction so that someone uh, who is not really into the topic at all can can follow. So that, that was a very interesting talk. Now, um, <clears throat> I wonder whether in your uh, probabilistic um, 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 approaches, you do also consider failure. So for example, you, let's say that you have, you have an if statement, which um, is uh, interested in checking a, the value of, of a variable X, which comes from the network. And, and uh, for some reason, the network fails. So the X just never shows up. Uh, that's failure, and it's it's different from like the the usual um, kind of CDFs and PDFs where you yes you, you... yes right. Have you considered failure? No, so we didn't consider, and uh, I see definitely that is uh, interesting. Is uh, mainly I think uh, that the randomness in our system is a uh, so. In our programming language, uh, randomness is internal. While I think uh, what you're proposing is to have uh, some uh, randomness that come uh, from the environment uh, rather than uh, from uh, the program itself. So when I say I sample X from uniform, is something internal that I can control. While uh, an external uh, form of uh, randomness here we didn't consider is interesting because actually it's something I consider in the past. Uh, 
Harley was mentioning my work on graded uh, stuff in a paper that we had at ESOP uh, 2015, maybe we had exactly this kind of failure. Um, so it was, uh, but it was uh, a toy example. So I would not uh, really, uh, I would not really consider it uh, as a interesting word on the topic. I see the interest of doing this. We didn't do it. And uh, I think it would be very interesting. Um, yeah, so so indeed, it, it, we have we have real interest into this, and I will get in touch with you afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. Now, so the thing is that in distributed systems, failure is is just the usual. So you, if you really want to analyze a system, the, analyze a program that that was written for um, distributed systems, then then failure is is indeed a part of your uh, your search space. Now. Um, yeah. However, having said that, um, I, I seem to understand that what you consider to be out of control is not quite what I have in mind. So, mm -hmm. okay. for example, I, I would say that, okay, <clears throat> an agreement between a service provider and, and a produce and, and a, uh, a client can be that, well, like, uh, if you give me this much query per second, this many queries per second, then I can only answer to this many of them and the rest I will just throw away, right? This is completely controlled. I see. Yeah. And it's, I see. It's so something failure. like, uh, yeah, I see. So, uh, all right. So this uh, kind of probability of failure, then I think is something that uh, uh, I have something to say about. But let me check if I understand. So for example, you can give me like, uh, uh, 10 queries and I decide that, is, that because of uh, some constraint, I can process only five. So I sample uh, five of them and those are the one I process and the other I just don't answer. And then you want to do consideration on this. Yeah, so, and, and that, can be, that can be dynamic and it can be like, like uh, according to load balancing and things of the like, some of it is out of our control, but we have the formulation. That's the point. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that there is a lot of work on this kind, of, and maybe you know this better than me because I'm not from that area. Um, uh, there is a lot of work on this uh, in uh, like, uh, uh, sorry, just one second, in a cyber physical system. Um, there has been a lot of work in trying to understand so the use they do of probability, I think, is uh, more aligned with what you have in mind. And um, what they, I think, uh, usually for the work I know they try to do is to have uh, uh, some uh, kind of uh, temporal logic or probabilistic temporal logic to reason about this. And uh, it could be somehow integrated with what we are doing, but uh, uh, I have no idea how to do it uh, right now. But that is uh, the place I would look for something in this direction. Thank you. Thank you. I, I could ask Hello. you a question. Yes. Uh, Yes, so ahead. yes, so I, I mean, you gave a very interesting talk. Thank you, Marco. But I was wondering. So you use specific uh, distributions. So you ma you mentioned Gaussian, then you used a lot of Laplace distributions. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was wondering how you uh, connect your symbolic execution to the specific nature of these distributions. So whether you know you, you first start to collect things and then you use some kind of engine that uh, will uh, have some kind of knowledge yeah. question or whatever of this distribution or whether it's done in another way. Yes, thanks. No, so the, the, the way we thought about this and then I have to admit like uh, my student, Jean-Pietre that uh, was working on this and uh, 
as you know, when you write your PhD thesis, there are many things uh, in the way, and I didn't get to do this part. But uh, um, the way I think about it is uh, you collect them, and then you can use uh, some uh, solver. In particular, uh, there are solver that manipulate uh, probabilities uh, uh, symbolically that you could use. Now, for many examples, since we, we use only Laplace, uh, one can try actually to write a simplified solver uh, because uh, we could use probability of, uh, sorry, property of the Laplace distribution to reason directly about that. And uh, this is what people do on paper because on paper, uh, having the knowledge of the distribution helps you a lot. Like, uh, Indeed, like the idea of coupling, for example, is something that can be used to avoid compute the distribution. This maybe is a, is a something I didn't emphasize. Oops, well enough, and now I lost my presentation. So let me see. Um, so that these computing probabilities actually is needed only to verify a counterexample. So this part, the soundness of the, veri for verification, the soundness of the logic, let me call it like this, the logic implemented by the symbolic execution is sound. And so you don't need to compute probabilities. Where you need is when you find that uh, like, uh, uh, the rule tell you that something, you derive something that is a, a contradiction in the logical part. But now you don't know if this is a true contradiction because now is where you need to know the probability. So that's the only place where we need really to compute the probabilities. But w when you prove, for instance, you know that uh, this magic program works, I mean, you, ca you can do something like this. I'm, I'm right or? Oh, OK, so when you prove uh, what you, I mean, uh, so like the place where you use probabilities is, is in the soundness of principle like this. So or even when you prove this a rule sound, mm -hmm. now you use probabilities. But the inside here, I know is very complicated. Um, but uh, mainly, you can do everything symbolically. And uh, for uh, just the verification, you don't need to compute the probabilities. So, because but the, the soundness of the rule uh, help you. No, I understand. So, but the, but the rule, because I, I'm I'm fascinated yeah. by this this rule. Yes, is is based on yeah. uh, the Laplace distribution. So you use it yeah. somewhere. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely the soundness of the rule. Yeah. And so my, so my my question is whether you can not reduce but understand the, the properties that you use of Laplace in some way to to con I mean to to relate. I mean, you know, my question, in fact, is how far you can relate uh, your uh, soundness to specific properties of the Laplace distribution, for instance, in that case. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So let me give you a specific uh, example here. So the one I was talking, the example of coupling, uh, let me see. Yes, this one. Oh, sorry, no, I have another slide. This one. So mainly what this tell us is uh, mainly that uh, the Laplace distribution has this property that uh, uh, by mainly is a shifting property. So you are shifting the distribution by K and you can compute directly how much the probability change. So this is one property. This is true for Laplace, but if you take another distribution, this is not true, okay? And uh, there is another property that is, uh, for instance, when you multiply uh, the probabilities. And that is more complicated because uh, now you are expanding the probability. So you definitely, for, for identifying specific relation for the coupling, mainly you definitely use the property of the distribution. And also in the soundness of your rule or, or you use this kind of shifting property of the yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah thanks 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 that was my question thank yeah. you very much marco yeah. yeah 
Great. Is there uh, any other questions before we adjourn for the weekend? All right. Well, thank you very good, uh, very much, Marco. Uh, it was really great. And uh, thank you, everybody else, for attending and uh, all the great questions. So have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Adley, for organizing this. And uh, next time, I hope for an invite in person. Okay. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and also for you to come to Boston, of course. Sure. Yeah, anytime. Well, you All know, right. after COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marco. Yeah.